Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Enterprise Linux Security. Uh, the saying goes that it's always DNS, but how long until email becomes like another conversation topic that's kind of close to DNS? How you doing, Joe? All good. It's always a pleasure to be here with you, Jay. Um, yeah, this time it seems like it's not DNS. It's actually um, <laughs> supposedly a security product, an email security gateway that uh, had a vulnerability that turns out to be really nasty. And it's been exploited by some apparently state-sponsored threat actors. So yeah, we've talked in the past about <laughs> top shelf vulnerabilities and exploits and attacks and all of that. This will be one of those. This will be not the run of the mill attacks and exploits that your organization might face when somebody is just, say, trying to drop some ransomware on your workstations. Um, this is something that apparently is targeted. Uh, it's politi politically motivated. And there are quite some interesting aspects, both to the vulnerability, the way that it was handled, the targeting, and we'll likely get through all of those. So this is in regards to their to Barracuda's email security gateway. I have to, you know, rehearse in my mind the ESG part of it because, you know, it's not something I work with every day, but I did work with it before. And I immediately, as I read the story, knew how big of a deal this was because I remember from when I used to be a system administrator that did this, I actually managed a Barracuda device for the company I worked for. And all the company's email was in Barracuda. If I wanted to restore an email, find out if an email was stuck, all these you know, weird things that we run into as sysadmins. It was inside Barracuda that I would go to find my answers. The Obviously, Exchange was its own problem, but that's a treasure trove. I mean, I just want to make sure I start with this because that's a treasure trove. This isn't just like a um, thing that email like passes through. It kind of does, but it, they're in there. They, they exist on the storage of this device. And disclaimer, it's been over a decade since I last worked with Barracuda. It could very well be different now, but knowing what I knew back then and in this story now, I kind of have a feeling about how big this is. Yeah. Um, again, just think back to the amount of important stuff that goes through your email daily. Um, now imagine you're, let's say, I don't know, a political figure, a trade guy, somebody really that's doing trade agreements between negotiating trade agreements between countries, a diplomat, something like that. And now all of a sudden your email server is spying on you. Um, it's very tricky. And there are some aspects of this where we see the, the attacker maintaining persistence and changing the scripts to react to events outside the um, the cyberspace and looking at real events, for example, negotiations between different countries. And the, we would see the scripts changing their targets to focus on the people that would be present at those negotiations. Um, this was definitely very targeted. Um, but let's start yeah. at the beginning here. So mm -hmm. on May 23, May 23rd, um, there was a vulnerability that was disclosed that affected uh, Barracuda's email security gateway. Um, pay attention to that date, May the 23rd. This is going to be important further down the line. Um, the, the vulnerability basically works like this. All the email that gets through the ESG, the, the email security gateway, is scanned, okay? Looking for malware and all of those things. Uh, when it finds an attachment, it scans the attachment. For some reason, for tar files that are attached to an email, it will uncompress them on the file system, look at them, and then do something based on that uh, analysis that it does. But the way that it uncompresses the tar file uh, means that it never actually checks the name of the files that it's using. It gets the list of the files that are inside, and then it extracts one by one without properly sanitizing the, the output there, uh, or the input in this case. Think of it similar to um, a SQL injection, where you have your command, and then at the end, you have another command that's not supposed to be there. But if you don't look at the input that you get, you're going to process that as an entire command. And you have, say, a drop table asterisk at the end, and then it's a fun day. Um, here, the, the idea was that the attacker would send a tar file with the 
a few files inside it. It didn't really matter what the files contained. It wasn't the content that was interesting. It was the name of the files inside of it. So if you named it in a specific way, you could trigger, say, a wget or a curl or something like that and have him pull a, a payload from the internet when the email gateway would scan that email. Now, another interesting thing here is that the emails themselves with the payload were targeted to specific individuals that had been discovered were behind ESG gateways or their emails were being served or hosted at an ESG gateway. And the email would be framed in such a way as to be immediately flagged the spam. Um, your friend Tom actually has a video about it explaining this vulnerability. He also, he also goes through this. Um, the idea is that if your email is automatically flagged as spam, it will go into the spam folder and never reach the user's inbox, so the user never knows that the email was there. The idea is just to target the ESG itself and not even alert the user. When was the last time that you went through your spam folder? I mean, I go like once a month if I remember, and I don't even make a habit of it. I actually do it regularly, but I'm, yeah, not the usual case. Not many people like me. <laughs> Absolutely. And when you see an email with a weird name like contact request uh, so-and-so that looks like it was from a form or something like that, you immediately just either delete it or ignore it. It's the usual thing that you do. Yeah, that plus the uh, you should sponsor our shady Windows product key company because apparently the Linux guy, I get all kinds of weird things that um, I have to delete regularly or this spam thing will swallow me whole <laughs> absolutely yeah. but it's not just the end user that won't see the email because it goes to spam it's also the sysadmins when they are doing analysis on the um, dsg after the fact after you know that it has been infected and you go looking for evidence you've been trained over the years to just see a spam email and your eyes just glaze over and move to the next one they ba you're basically trained to ignore those types of emails and this has been specifically crafted so that it fits that pattern so that you will ignore these emails when you see them unless you know exactly what you're looking for you go over the list of subjects and you spam 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 ignore um, um and i kind of feel like there's i mean email security and, and scanning malware and all of that is 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 one thing but um, for my memory, Barracuda also helped spam as well. That was another thing that it did, at least the implementation that the company had. And it did a good job of that, but that also means that the spam box in Barracuda or whatever your solution is, is much larger. That's your company-wide spam box. And, and it's one thing not to pay attention to your spam folder, but imagine trying to pay attention to everyone's spam folder. Now, that's a big ask for anybody. Back in my sysadmin days, one of the things that we would see was that the same spam email would go to a large proportion of the accounts that we had. Say, if we had like thirty thousand accounts, like half would get the exactly same, the exact same spam email. So uh, we would just filter by it and just uh, remove it from all of the mailbox at once. But yeah, that's something that you see when when you're concentrating all the emails and all the spam on one place, it's going to get massive really, really quickly. So it's easy to miss something like this. It's just lost in the noise. Um, but this was part of what the, the attacker was relying upon. They would get their payload in through the, through the name of the file being specifically crafted for this. And again, this is, this is not a new threat, a new attack vector. I mean, we've had SQL injection for years, but using this on the name of tar files, this is something that I haven't seen previously. It might have existed, but I wasn't aware of it. And I found it particularly interesting. There's also a shell um, expansion that can get in the way of some of the names you might have in, in a file name. And they aren't even preparing, defending against that. They just take the name and use it as trusted and let's Pass this as an argument and escape. They want the, the shell. <laughs> yeah. They want the shell. <laughs> so, yeah. and they got it. So, right. that would run with the privileges that the email uh, process would have, which was typically root on this um, on this appliance. And yeah, now they have a they have a payload. That payload would start the reverse shell, which is a traditional connection goes from client to server, say an SSH, con an SSH connection to your open SSH server. You start the connection as the client. 
A reverse shell is the other way around. The server initiates the connection to you as the client. Um, it's very easy to test this at home. Just Google Netcat uh, reverse shell and you'll find plenty of examples on how to do this. They didn't use Netcat. They use OpenSSL functions directly to, to open the reverse shells so that the, the, um, the communication was encrypted. But it's the same principle. The server would connect back to their command and control servers. This had the added benefit of not requiring the ESG, gate, the, the email security gateways, to be exposed to the internet directly. These servers were being compromised without ever having to touch the internet directly. They could be behind the company firewall. They could be behind a filtering system. They could be behind anything. As long as the email could reach them, it could be hacked. So it's like a mail bomb, basically, like we used to call them way back when. That's what we called some things. Now, I hate to be that guy, but I had this thought, and I'm sure this is you know the first thing anybody thought of, and I'm not unique here, and it's probably not a factor, but at first I thought this is literally why the no exec flag exists when you're mounting a file system, because you really don't want anything to execute from storage unless it needs to, but then the reverse shell, is that like making the no exec thing like uh, not even an issue in this, or is it, or am I just oversimplifying this? The payload that they were using, that was actually part of the file name, not the one that they got from the internet afterwards, already set them the right bits so that it would be executable. So they took but, care of that. But with no exec on the file system in FS tab, depending on if it's like Linux on the uh, underneath the hood, you could, as you already know, you could just stop any ability from anything being executable for that folder. But I'm just wondering. Is it because uh, it's accessing maybe something outside that file system that it doesn't matter? Or I take it that it's because the process that was running was the, the scanning process oh. that was part of ESG. That was what triggered the rest. So that process was running and had the ability to run. It would just pick up the instructions that it would have to run from the file name. So it's creating that... child processes instead of exactly. executing directly. From exactly. Them. Okay, I get it. So. Yeah, they were doing the end compression to a temporary folder. I don't know exactly which location they were using, but it was the process running the scanning that was that would trigger that execution. Um, now, Barracud asks for help from Mendiant. Um, if you're if you're not aware, Mendiant is the security branch of Google, um, so they brought in some pretty heavyweights around this to help them out. Um, with finding the, the, the attack vector, the threat analysis, the mitigation, the, the, the risk assessment. And after they did this analysis, they discovered that the first, uh, the first events that were triggering this um, vulnerability, the first exploits, were from October 2022. That's eight months prior to being discovered. As I've alluded in the past, and some people have called me out on this, that it's not really true, um, I would like to point out that when a vulnerability is announced today, it doesn't mean that it simply popped into existence today. It's been out there for some time, and some people might have known about it. And in this case, the attacker knew about it for at least eight months, and probably before that, for all the work that it that it went into actually crafting the right scripts and the right tools and the right plugins, and we'll get into that in a moment. To work in an ESG environment, they had to know about this vulnerability for way longer than that. They had to have development type on top of this so that they had the right tools ready to use on the attack. Um, so, wait, wait a minute. People disagree with you on that? I thought that was just the truth. I'm, I'm... Yeah, I've had some people complain that, uh, yeah, you don't really know that. Yeah, we do. We've had some real life examples of attacks that happened and took months until they were discovered. Wow, they and have that opinion. It... We should send them like every episode on a DVD yeah. and, and some books and some security courses because that's literally the Still. definition of a zero day. <laughs> I mean, Still. Yeah. Um, anyway. But but that is important. Actually, let's let's go back into that. It's important because we're that focused on patching stuff immediately as soon as they're discovered and as soon as the patch is available. We're forgetting when we say that we took a week to patch that vulnerability. That that's one week on top of all the amount of time that it has already been available and exploitable out there. Um, so when you're looking at your patching practices and you're considering, oh, we're patching within 30 days to meet compliance. 
that's a really long time. That's not just the 30 days that you're taking, that's 30 days plus all the amount of time that you have no way of knowing how long it was. You only control the part after the announcement and you need to make that as short as possible. You need to patch as soon as possible. And a story like this one only gives more credence to that. Um, yeah. You really cannot afford to wait days or weeks or something like that to patch a vulnerability. You have no idea how long it has been there. Um, earlier this year, and I'm going to use Curl as an example because I really like it. I use it daily and it's a great project. But Curl has had some really long-standing vulnerabilities in the code. One that I wrote a blog article about um, for the TechSeer blog was in the code base for over 20 years. The vulnerability was in the code for 20 years. Let that sink in. And it was only discovered and fixed earlier this year. That's a really long time. In IT world, yeah, okay. you still didn't have virtualization or the cloud when it got into the code base. So Let me think that about that. Like we could literally have in that amount of time two file systems brand new come out and be accepted in enterprise <laughs> level <laughs> applications, okay? Twice in that same amount of time. Because it, yeah. you know, takes at least five years. Um now to the reiterate your point here um when we say you should install your patches what we never say is that it'll protect you 100 it, it, it's all you need to do we never say that and here's the plain truth when you install all available updates let's just say you have updated everything you have updated your firmware you have updated your packages you have restarted the services that go along with that you are 100 up to date with your distro you have minimum security that's what those updates are going to give you it like like you're saying to put it in perspective that is just what we know about just what we've heard about just what we've discovered we're patching the things we know about but that does nothing i repeat nothing to the things we don't know about the only thing we can hope for in that case is maybe by patching one thing we accidentally patch something else that we didn't know about that yeah. probably has happened but the reality is we're always patching what we know about. And that's the, the that's what we're up against here, why we tell you to always have different layers because that's your minimum security. Everything is minimum, right? Like you do the updates, you configure your firewall. But in this case, to bring it back to our point here, um, none of that even matters if um, you know your security appliance is evil. I mean, <laughs> that, that yeah. all that goes out the window if you have an evil appliance in your in your stack. Yeah. And I mean, you can have that appliance as protected as you went. You can have all the patch levels that you went. By the end of the story, and I'm going to spoil this a bit, um, on May 23rd, when the vulnerability was announced, um, Barracuda actually told everybody that they should update. They had released some patches that were supposed to fix this, and everybody should patch and correct the issue so that they would be secure, because this was really dangerous. By the end of the story, they stop with all the patching stuff. Just RMA all the appliances that you have and we'll switch them over. There's no way to salvage Ooh. this. Oh, man. Okay? That's, that's the point at where we are right now with this uh, with these enterprise security gateways, email security gateways. They're oh, not salvageable wow. anymore. The The vendor itself says that they are not salvageable. So imagine the amount of... Even a factory reset wouldn't mm, work. Well, apparently they don't trust the, the system itself anymore or the images wow. that would be pulled by them, the factory reset. Now, when the attacker managed to have somebody actually managed to send an email that triggered the reverse shell and got access to this, it still needed persistence. And this is when this just gets massive. Now, um, <laughs> The, way, the amount of different ways that the attacker used to gain persistence on one of these gateways, it's amazing. Um, this email gateway has something called plugins. You can actually develop special code in Lua uh, that enhances the functionality or lets you add new filtering capabilities, the, the works. You can create plugins for this. So what did they do? They added 
five or six different cron entries with different scripts to reinstate them and reinstall the, the modules if they were deleted. They were adding themselves to init slash rc so that it would be run at start. They de installed the kernel module that would do the same stuff um, on boot if one of the others wasn't working. They were actually having... Um, they were changing the code of the installed plugin so that they would reinstate the reverse shells if it was removed. They would actually change the Lua code of the actual plugins in the, the gateway to recreate the reverse shells in case some of the other stuff was removed. Hmm. They went to the work of doing something called time stomping. Um, when you upload the file to a server, it's usually easy to filter by the most recent files that get in there. Um, that makes a, an uploaded file, even if it's malicious, even if it's in the wrong directory, easy to find. Even with the find utility, you can find and filter by date, for example, or just sort by the most recent or something like that. That's very easy to do. So they would deploy to the system and they would go to the work of changing the date on the file that they uploaded so that it would match the files around it, so that it wouldn't stick <laughs> like a sore thumb. Now, did they use Agile or Waterfall while they made all this? <laughs> Sorry. This is why this is why I say that when they started the attack in on October, they had all this stuff already in place. So they had to have had a huge amount of development effort and a huge amount of development time behind this to create all of these tools and all of these scripts. Yeah. Additionally, because this isn't enough, they created a pickup filter, a packet capture filter that would listen on port 25 and port 587, both SMTP ports, and waited for magic packets from the attackers so th that they would be sleeping, not doing anything. And then when they received a specially crafted email, they would start up and fire another reverse shell, just yet another way to maintain persistence in case the others were detected and eliminated. The ridiculous amount of different ways that these guys went to just to remain on the system, this is incredible. Um, they had the yeah. module that would, <laughs> again, multiple modules for BSMTPD. SMTP, BSMTPD is the Barracuda SMTP daemon, the software that they use that actually manages the email flow in the gateway. They created co um, the plugins for it. and. It's not so much creating a plugin that's the issue. It's creating code that actually does something and still has the backdoor capabilities and doesn't break so that it doesn't get detected. So they didn't just sloppily created some random code or pulled some code from somewhere and then plugged it in and eventually it would crash. This would actually work and do something in addition to the backdoor capabilities that it had. Yeah. Um, Hmm. The names are funny. This is a Barracuda ESG, so they had CSPY was the name of the packet capture filter. Saltwater was the name of a module for BSMTPD. Seaside was the Lua, <laughs> the Lua module for BSMTPD. Um, Seaside was another Lua module that would moderate that would monitor SMTP traffic looking for the emails that they would be interested in, particular emails. They would have, as if this wasn't enough, they would modify the code in the original Lua plugins, and they would deploy specific scripts lo looking for specific target for specifically target email addresses. They were targeting academic people and people in government, people in specific countries, people in diplomatic channels, and when emails from those persons were found, they would be bundled together and sent back to a command and control system. This is a highly evolved operation and they targeted thousands of ESG gateways. And when you go past a certain number of compromised systems that deal with emails, at some point you're going to be capturing messages on both sides of the connection. You're probably going to be inside the sender's email gateway and the receiver's email gateway. That gives you a lot of visibility into communications and talks between different individuals. This was really, really massive. Wow, it's like the very definition of own, like the 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 def the textbook definition of own is this. They have owned completely these devices. That is insane. And this is why Barracuda no longer trusts the devices. These are just the stuff that has been found. I imagine there are others. Could be firmware problems for all we know. It might be in there too. Um, one one question, just to, for clarification. Sure. So the eight months you were referring to. 
Um, was that, I mean, they, they, did they just discover this or were they sleeping on this information for that for eight months? That's what I want to know. Cause that's how I trust a company is how forthcoming they are with information like this. I assume there were samples discovered in the wild of something and it was communicated to Barracuda and then they looked into it. There is a timeline on the Mandiant report. We're going to have a link for the Mandiant report that is behind all of this story. Uh, Mandiant created a great analysis of the whole, uh, the hack, the process, the tools and all of that. And they have a timeline for this. Apparently Barracuda was alerted to this on the 19th of May and on the 23rd they went public with this and uh, with the patches. Okay. Well, that I guess that's seems, not, I've, we've heard of wor worse things than that. That seems like it's very quickly, but then there is the second step to this. The patches became ineffective two days afterwards when the attacker upgraded their tools. It took two days for the attacker to patch their tools. There are probably sysadmins out there that still haven't updated their ESGs yet, and they did it in two days. Well, they're waiting for the maintenance window the next time that occurs in three months from now because you know they're on the maintenance window when the first patch hit but now we're about three months off the way some companies do it i mean talking in this type of things in abstract when you're trying to get your point across or something like that and you make up some examples of oh you can get owned and your systems can be can get hacked and all of that seeing a real life example of this playing out in the field and the amount of effort that gets put into this and the speed with which things happen and the i mean the amount of system stuff that gets changed during an attack like this it's massive and again this is why they don't trust the systems anymore and they will just replace them <laughs> you can't be sure that you caught all of them after all of the examples that were found you are absolutely no, in no way sure that you got all of them um but let's continue because this hasn't this doesn't stop yet because they're communicating with command and control systems, they don't want anybody to snoop on their traffic. Using a certificate would be able to flag their traffic if you found out which certificate it was. So what happens when you deploy an ESG gateway is that during the installation, you will use a self-signed certificate provided by Barracuda itself. After installation, that certificate remains on the system. The attacker knows that the certificate remains on the system. So they use the exact same certificate to encrypt their communications. So their communications to the command and control servers were then with the encryption provided by Barracuda and the certificates provided by Barracuda itself. This is literally adding <laughs> insult to injury. Ouch. Yeah. Um, like I'm feeling that. Like that ouch has been... <laughs> Ow, like if I was Barracuda and ow, that's painful. Like that's horrible. Oh God, that's, you don't want that. This is exactly what we mean when we talk about targeted attacks. It's when the attacker goes through all the effort of actually learning your platform in and out so that they can craft stuff like this. This is really, really nasty. Are they certified Barracuda administrators? <laughs> if there is such a thing, I mean, do they? I mean, if not, they probably should take that exam if there is such an exam because they probably pass it at this point. If they went to change careers, I'm sure Barracuda is looking for great engineers that know their platform and can start working immediately. Well, they apparently do. <laughs> Okay, so some statistics around this. The targeted organizations, even though the the actual people that they were, the actual email addresses belong to people who are from Hong Kong and Taiwan, South Asia, some European countries, governments. They targeted organizations in the Americas, in Europe and Middle East, and Asia Pacific. 55% were on the Americas, 24 Europe, Middle East, and the rest Asia Pacific. Um, it's interesting because the targets were not specifically there. They were more focused on targets around China and people from countries around China themselves rather than the Americas. But it's, again, back to what I said before, uh, controlling both sides of the communication. If I'm emailing a diplomat that's on an organization somewhere, I don't just want to see the emails that get exchanged directly to that, per that person. I then want to see the emails that that person sends somewhere else as response or to get to let somebody else know of what is being discussed in diplomatic channels this is really important to get to give you the the entire context of something so the goal was obviously espionage 
the goal was not uh, hacking the systems just to hack the systems. They were after information. They were looking for specific information and they were looking for political... Again, the, the political motivation is behind all of this. Um, I've mentioned China before. The Mendiant Report doesn't go out and spell... Actually, it does. It does mention the People's Republic of China's likely candidate for sponsoring the, the attack or being behind the group that is responsible for this. For many reasons that the Mendiant Report points out, one of which, which is not that little, is that some of the, the IPs used for the command and controls have in the past been used by other attackers that have been known to be from the sponsored by the, the Chinese government. And the, the IPs are from the same block, the same infrastructure block. Um, so not just that, but that as well, and the specific targets used and all that. I tend to refrain a lot from pointing figure, fingers at, oh, it's this country or that country or the other country, but right. here it's overwhelming. There isn't yeah. much to, to go over around this or try to ignore this. This is overwhelming. And again, it's been one of the most advanced hacking attempts, actual success, successful hacking attempts that we've seen in the past, at least I have, and we've seen quite a lot. Um, and it goes to without saying, this is one that got caught. Okay. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. There are likely many others that are happening right now that we still haven't caught. Not from China, but other hacks that are just as evolved as this one, just as targeted as this one, affecting other systems, other software, other packages. And again, as long as there are enough resources sponsoring something like this, nothing is out of reach. Well, so what's a company to do about this? Obviously, you know, the short answer could be replacing or getting that replacement and installing it, but I just wonder, is it going to harm trust? Is, is company, our company is going to go, because even though, yeah, they got owned really hard, Barracuda is not the only company that can be owned or ever has been owned. So um, while this stands out as unique in the, the scope and the amount of detail that they put into this, they, these types of things happen. So in your opinion, what is a company to do um, about this going forward, do you think? There are actually quite a few things. Um, first, Barracuda, as we've mentioned, has changed their advisory, no longer just patch, now completely isolate the, the gateways, take them out of production and just RMA them, send them back, we'll, we'll replace them. Um, that's basic stuff. Other things that are part of the, the Mandiant report include imaging the, the system so that you can do forensic analysis on this. Apparently, this is running a RAID 1 configuration to disks. You can just pull one out and image that and retain that for your forensic analysis and still re return the, the system. Um, Mandiant report provides over a hundred in, um, indicators of compromise, a hundred uh, things that you can look for inside of your environment to see if you're being hacked right now as part of this. If your systems are were targeted by something like this and there is still persistence going on, over a hundred indicators of compromise. It's quite massive. Most attacks will have a handful of them at most, which is the payload, the IP addresses that are used for command and control, some type of indication or leftover files or logs or something like that that, you, that are used as indicators of compromise. There's over a hundred on this situation. It's quite, quite a lot. Um, you should look for certificate usage that matches the Barracuda certificates. So you can look for communications, encrypted communications inside of your environment that are using that certificate as the, the means to, to get the, the encryption. Um, you should conduct the forensic analysis of that image from the hard disk, looking specifically for the initial email compromise, the initial email that uh, hacked your system, where the payload came from. Uh, when you find that, at least you'll know when the attack started and you know when to look at other systems logs and when to start looking for other lateral movement uh, indicators, other possible compromises. In some situations, again, because this was targeted and this wasn't just something that was randomly targeting all the systems that are out there, there were systems where it was shown that 
The attacker was logged in directly and was running reconnaissance on other systems around the ESG and looking around to see what other systems uh, the attacker could reach. So there has likely been some lateral movement, at least attempts, if not actually successful. So you should look for that as well. Finding the initial entry point, the initial email that compromised the ESG will let you know when you need to start looking at the logs. And now there's that dangling question, okay, how am I going to look at the logs if my ESG is offline or if I sent it back or something like that? That's why you use centralized logging. You're using centralized logging, right? I was until I broke it. But <laughs> then again, you know, I'm a little bit of a different case because I have backups of the future and not many people can say that because yeah. I always have everything created ahead of time. So it's like restore the website and there might even be like a couple months of content, but um, no, honestly, centralized logging is is definitely the thing I could do better. But in this case, it would really help out in finding the, the right stuff. Um, again, then there's the usual stuff. You should patch and you should patch as soon as possible. You should patch everything. Remember, in this case, the, the systems that were being compromised didn't even have to be reachable from the internet directly. So if you have a system that's behind the firewall and it's segmented and it's locked away and something like that, see if there's a scenario like this that can play out and still reach it. If it's still processing traffic that comes from outside of your organization, even if not directly, even if it goes, say, through a load balancer or through some filtering or something like that before it reaches the system, it might still be hackable. Then people sometimes are working under the impression, okay, as long as no external traffic reaches the system, nobody can get into. This is a blatant example of an attack just like that. The systems did not have to be exposed to the internet as long as they could receive the email somehow. You could have an email bouncer or something like that receiving the emails and then sending them this way. They could still be hacked. Um, and the reverse shells didn't have to receive the, the connection from the outside. They would initiate the connection themselves. So it likely wouldn't even trigger alerts on the firewall. It was yeah, initiated yeah. by the server. Probably a process name that's understood as a, a okay process for all we know. That's, you know, something like that would be probably why it would be under the radar. Thank you for mentioning process. I had forgotten about that. Remember me mentioning that one of the persistence vectors were the, was the kernel module? Well, that kernel module, in addition to reestablishing persistence, did something else. It would hide from the process list all the, pro the other processes that the attack would use. So they wouldn't show up on PS, on top. They wouldn't even be listed under slash proc. So this guy has actually covered all their bases. They know Linux pretty well, I'd have to say. Yeah, yeah. they've they've been around. Yeah, they, they they know they know kernel development level stuff at that point. They've been around, and yeah, this is the type of things that can hit you out there in the real world. This is not just hypothetical. We usually say that, but when you see this playing out, it's different. It really drives the point home. I think. I think it does too, but I really do feel like people that listen should be, you know, like this article, for example, it's only a couple of pages, not only read it, but print it, put it in a portfolio, just, just keep a stack of various, you know, things that happened in the industry. So the next time, you know, you have trouble getting buy-in, you could have examples of, yeah, but if, but if we, you know, this company also thought that way and look what happened to them and look what happened to this company and um, not not to be mean or rude to the person, but it, it's like getting buy-in. A lot of people don't understand this stuff. And to, to give them something tangible, you know, as, as evidence, hey, we need to pay attention to these different attack um, venue, avenues, then I think that really helps. If nothing else, just keep it bookmarked somewhere. And keep doing it every time we talk about an article. And keep in mind, the the companies, the size of companies that are using ESGs is all over the place. And there are some very large companies using it. The the type of companies that will have a dedicated cybersecurity team that will have all the required policies and practices in place and do the training and all of that. And still they can get owned. So imagine a company that doesn't have all of that, that is just running off the shelf stuff to go by and you're just having your antivirus and you just do your patches every now and then when you feel like it and yeah the risk increases a lot when you approach it like this and even if you're doing everything right it can still happen if there was a true turnkey solution that you know 
actually prevented things, then there'd be no podcast because there'd be turnkey solutions for everything. We wouldn't have anything to talk about. And the fact that, you know, solutions exist that claim to be turnkey and we still have a podcast that tells you everything you need to know right there. The honest truth is that it's really hard to stop a truly motivated attacker. Right. Somebody that can get this amount of resources, the development resources, the time it takes to create the, the scripts and the applications and the modules and all of that, and do it properly and test it and distribute it and find the right ex vulnerability to exploit and do the updates when the the other side creates the protections and they go over and they implement better tools and better attack features. This takes a lot of resources. This takes a lot of effort. When you have attackers that are motivated like this, that have these resources at their disposal, it's really, really hard to defend against. You can have the best cybersec team in the world. You can have all the best practices yeah. intent. You need to be prepared for something like this to still hit you, even if you're doing all of that. And don't treat it like it's a one-off exception. This has just happened to them and it will never happen to somebody else. There were thousands of companies running ESG that got owned by this. And they probably all thought the same thing, that it wasn't going to happen to them. And they found out that it could. And I think yeah. that's the mindset to delete. It, it can happen to anyone. All you have to do is um, be on the receiving end of a bot if your security is really weak or a targeted attack if your security is relatively strong. Um, the only thing that separates someone getting in is how determined they are. That's it. And if you're thinking, yeah, but I'm not a political actor, my company isn't involved in all of that. Yeah, but your company has IP, your company has intellectual property that they want to protect and they don't want their competitors to know about. That can be a pretty good motivator as well. Um, Again, there will always be reasons to do something like this. And you know, the best you can do is try to cover all your bases, but always work under the assumption that even if you do, there might still be a way. You cannot rest on your laurels just because, okay, I have my patching in place, I have my antivirus in place, my firewall, I have everything covered, my users are really good, they don't click on links on emails and all of that there's always a way here you didn't have to click a link your email gateway just had to look at the email it's as easy as that well there's three rules for perfect security don't use a computer don't turn <laughs> one on and don't own one perfect security yeah. right there but unfortunately that's not something yeah we, 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 we need our technology is fortunate or unfortunate as it is it's fortunate if you're on you know your technology is working great Unfortunate, they have to have to deal with something like this, but it's uh, the yin of the yang. Unfortunately, I think how appropriate that yin and yang. Um, and yeah, uh, on that very cheerful note, um, thank you very much for joining the the podcast. This was a really interesting story, at least I thought so. That's why I, I brought it up. Um, lots of interesting aspects to it. Lots of stuff that you should pay attention to, and it's the type of things that. Uh, Again, at least to me, it does. It makes me consider different things that I, that I should be doing and things that I should be doing differently because this is the type of threat vector that I have not considered previously and I might now look at, like, how is my email being filtered? And I'll probably take a look at that. Um, again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure as always. And until the next one. Thank you. See you around.